My name is Carlos Caloni. Our headlines this hour, empty plates and more shocking revelations from Joy News' latest uncover or undercover investigations sends quake and shivers down the spines of Ghana's education minister, who has deployed a full-scale fact-finding mission to check acute shortage in schools across the country. We want to assure Ghanaians that, yes, uh, we, we are not running a perfect system. Uh, of course, we are running a, a system with human interface. Even if there are challenges, the assurance is that we are going to resolve the challenges as soon as possible. And parents are agitated with revealing more startling experiences and comparing the free senior high school policy to a prison sentence. The government should take a look into it. They are not fed properly. They are made to work like horses. Like, I don't know. In fact, I think this is the second prison yard. Even the prison, those in the prison, I don't think they go through what these girls are going through. Also, showing of Joy News' sick hospital documentary in Parliament as part of the State of the Nation address debate nearly disrupts sitting. We have details from Parliament. And later, brilliant eight-year-old Ikea and Koban needs $88,000 for urgent treatment and bone marrow transplant. I don't know how we are going to raise such an amount. And she is also not going to be fit if the bone marrow transplant is not done. Yes, she is going weaker and weaker by the day. We are grateful you could join us here now. The Education Ministry, in response to a yet to be aired Joy News documentary titled Empty Plate, the Free SHS Promise, embarked on a tour of uh, three senior high schools in the Greater Accra region to assess food for, uh, provided to students under the Free SHS program. Now, the Joy News expose highlights acute shortage of food at the various campuses and the quality of, of meals served to students. Uh, let's take a look at the promo. On our latest investigative piece, Empty Plate, the free SHS promise. Sometimes they'll give you Gary, don't give you beans. They'll give you beans, they don't give you the Gary. So a school that is not having even 900 students is supposed to have three bats a day to feed 900 students. Every night, these children go to bed burdened with thoughts about what they will eat when they wake up to a new day. It's all about the quantity and the, and the general tool quantity. Mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. And then the amount of salt they sell per table. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's everything. Very soon. Very soon. Some people don't even get these items. It is no fault of theirs that the government that promised their parents free education is unable to provide enough food to feed their youthful appetites. And sometimes kinky. The kinky they give us to or shit or we blow fish. Empty plate. The free as you just promise. Coming soon on Joy News. Now joining me in studio for a better understanding of Empty Plate is a Joy News channel manager, Peku Oso Pepra. Even before this documentary airs, uh, the Empty Plate documentary is already sending shivers down the spines of authorities about the true state of feeding in our schools. So uh, I want to find out from you, what actually informed this particular documentary? Well, we received calls. We had people complain. We had uh, parents speak. Some children would send voice notes. And so, in the spirit of public interest journalism, we decided to verify. So what we've done is to verify and, and, and put pictures to the assumptions and the guesswork and the calls. And this is the work we've done is, is, is compelling. Mm. It's extensive in the sense that it covers entire country. Um, from the north, we went to the middle sector, we came to Accra, the eastern region, the Volta region, it is the entire country. So it is not just focused uh, here in the greater Agro region? No, and I guess um, um, everybody has to just wait and watch the documentary and you would know how far the length and breadth, width and depth of the documentary. So what have you uncovered briefly for our viewers to understand in terms of the food shortage? How serious a problem is it? Our story is about the quantity of the food that is served. The story reveals a lot about who gets what to eat. 
And it is not for any reason that the story is titled Empty Plates. It's a metaphor to, to give expression to what you find in the dining halls. So what we have done here is to give meaning to the struggles of the students and to let the powers that be know that yes, the free SHS is a good policy. Nobody can argue with that, but there are challenges and they have to be fixed. This is what we have done in the spirit of public interest journalism, which emboldens us, which encourages us, which becomes our mandate to bring and to mirror society to itself. That's what we've done. All right, so this is focused on the problem, highlighting it, and then getting it resolved, basically. It also tells you about the impact of the free SHS campaign okay. and how it has created access. I guess we should all wait and enjoy the documentary, pick the lessons from it, and fix the problem. All right. Thank you so much uh, for speaking to us here on Joy News Prime. I guess you're going to be uh, looking forward to this particular documentary. So we cannot hear from uh, some parents who told Joy News their children are being treated like prisoners. And another concern is uh, their food. To be frank, they are not eating any better food at all. So every time she will call, that mommy, I don't have money. The food is not enough and sometimes it's not even good. To, to be frank with you, this girl left home without stomach pain. But now she will call the mommy my tummy. She has been admitted at the hospital. They did other tests, but she said the doctors are so, so, uh, suspecting it's ulcer. It is very bad. We are not saying they should not eat Gary, but the Gary is too much. And according to the girls, the Gary is dried with some sauce on it. It is very even home. How many of us could eat those food? The complaining that the rice is very small. And they to be the food the girls eat is very bad. Very pathetic. And it's so sad that the outside will see a different picture, but the inside is a different issue altogether. I think the government should take a look into it. They are not fed properly. They are made to work like horses. Like, I don't know. In fact, I think this is the second prison yard. Even the prison, those in the prison, I don't think they go through all this. Now, from Laboni Senior High School to Presec Legon, my colleague Kenneth Jesse was part of the team from the Education Ministry and Free SHS Secretariat that uh, was taken to the dining halls of some elected schools uh, in Accra and uh, in our report. The Free Senior High School has come under criticism recently, especially with the food served to students. The quality of the food and the amount of food served to students have become a topical issue but the education ministry says they are working at improving things. Here is the Ministry of Education's public relations officer. At every point, you should understand that you, you may not necessarily have a perfect system. You have a system that is being run with a human hands in it. So there may be some challenges in terms of distributional challenges, in terms of storage challenges. But your duty as leadership is that when these challenges come, you go in and resolve it. I think we have to situate it in a very proper context. What is that very proper context? If you look at buffer stock, their distribution chain, at every point they are supposed to send about 18 food items. In between the 18 food items and even GCX, you may have a school with supplies of about 17 food items. I mean, let's even narrow it down to our various homes. You may have milo, you may have milk, you may have sugar, you may have uh, uh, plantain, but you may not have beans. It does not necessarily mean that you are unable to cook. But maybe within the preferred choice of food that you want to cook, that is where you may have a difficulty. But of course, what do you do as a parent or as the owner of the house? Quickly, you have to intervene. And when there are those challenges, you go in and resolve it. I mean, these, these children are not children from, from a different continent. <laughs> they are our own children. They are our own brothers and sisters. So our biggest priority is to make sure that they are being fed morning, afternoon, evening. At the Laboni Senior High School, the students tell me that although they are given breakfast, lunch, and supper every day, it is not always that the food is balanced. There are slight instances where it's not balanced. It's just once a while. But then I think we would need more of the balancing of the food. 
there, um, there may be instances where they are not balanced foods, but then sometimes I think we would need maybe when we are taking what we will need egg to each person, but then now it's no more. So we pray, we are hoping that they bring it back, but then for the rest, we think it's okay. Manage. So the education ministry took us on a tour to three secondary schools in the Greater Accra region. St. Thomas Aquinas, Presbyterian Boys Secondary School, and Laboni Senior High School. And in these schools, the students say that although they are fed all the time, that usually their breakfast, which is predominantly liquid, comes without bread. And on some occasions, they have bread to add to it. What was for breakfast this morning? Okay, we had um, some brown with bread. Yeah. Some brown and bread. And is it, does it always come with bread, your breakfast? No, nah, it's not always. Just, just sometimes, but not always. Yeah. So how often does it come without bread? Yeah, very often, yeah. Yeah, I think Fridays that we get bread. Yeah. Throughout the week, it's only Fridays that you have breakfast with bread. Yeah. Usually, it's without bread. Yeah, we don't we don't get bread all the time. Just fri just Fridays. So most of the times, me personally, I come Fridays because I like them because there's bread. Yeah, the bread on Fridays. Yeah. Not long ago, Africa Education Watch advised government to allow parents who have their awards in boarding school to pay for the free senior high school. The National Democratic Congress, NDC, has also said that they will review the free senior high school should they win power come December. But the question is, will that review ever happen? Time will tell. From Presec Lagon, Kenneth Jesse, for Joy News. Now, Chrissy Quatton speaks for the Ministry of Education and he joins me via Zoom for more on this particular story. Mr. Quatton, you were part of the team that told the schools earlier today. Tell us what you saw and your general impression about the state of affairs. Hello, kindly unmute your device so we can hear you, sir. Are you able to hear me now? Perfectly so. All right, so good evening to you and good evening to your viewers. Let me hasten to add that in terms of our regional visitations, it's not only limited to that of Greater Accra. And I'm sure subsequently, uh, your correspondence across the length and breadth of the country are going to feed you with the pictures and videos that they picked from uh, the respective schools across the, I mean, the country. The purpose of this visitation uh, largely is occasioned by the fact that we needed to have a first-hand information ourselves about the food situation in the schools mm -hmm. and also where even there are challenges. Our duty as leadership is to quickly intervene and resolve them. But of course, before I proceed with our findings, mm -hmm. I want to set the premise that uh, the media is our friends. And nobody faults the media from coming out with any reportage that uh, provides us with positive feedback to be able to uh, do our work. Mm. Uh, when a work is fraught with, uh, 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 I mean, one-sided view, obviously to push a certain motive, and 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 sometimes when it's discussed in a very dispassionate manner, particularly when the lives of children are involved, parents are sitting in the house. It becomes quite problematic. Of course, I have I have listened to your your I mean your playback, some of the, some of the interviews, some of the some of the commentaries that are being run by parents and other things. Uh, interestingly, it appears same voice or same uh, voiceover was repeated in last year your documentary. But that is not the point. The 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 point is that granted, without even admitting that that is even the case, we we have to admit that as a people. Even though we are not where we have to be, we are definitely also not where we used to be. It's almost becoming like 
almost everything is bad. Mr. Gwate, so 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 that is the more reason why we have uh, the, we having this conversation now. Yeah, so yeah, you can yeah, also yeah, tell yeah, us yeah, your yeah. side of the story. You've gone yeah, round, yeah. you've seen things for yourself. What is the state of affairs in these schools that you visited? Well, well, I don't even believe in Kwesi Patin's side of the story. It's about objective reality, and objective reality is what we captured in the schools. Mm. I mean, interesting enough, uh, some scenes were, were, were avoided and uh, again raises question marks. But I mean, the point is that when we went to the schools, obviously... You but I, hope, I hope you know that in terms of objectivity, we report only what we see. I hope you, you, you reckon that. Uh, that's what I'm saying, that conversations like this should not only be geared towards increasing likes, views, and shares. It mm. should be a dispassionate conversation geared uh, addressing problem. I mean, but, Claire, but, but you, I do, I, you believe that this is not part of our reason. Ours is to do objective journalism oh, to tell the oh, story. Obviously, Project. obviously, obviously. But you see, when, when you carry on journalism, where you take images of, I mean, suppose students that whose faces are not showing, who are carrying, I mean, Gary or Sheto, I mean, mixed with liquid, which is obviously not the food that is not being served in a dining hall, and then commentaries are run over it, it becomes quite problematic. But I mean, I mean, come to the point that you earlier raised. We visited schools, not only in Greater Accra, nationwide is being done, uh, from headmasters, from the accounts of students and everything, and from what we all saw in the videos, they are adequate and enough. You see, at every point, I've always wanted us to situate the conversation in a very right context. If you look at the food distribution and food supply, GCX and Buffer Stock are responsible for sending uh, supplying 18 food items. When we went to Greater Accra, for instance, today, all the 35 schools in Greater Accra, per the original uh, uh, stores officer, mm -hmm. admitted that every school has a minimum of 15 food items. So there may be situations, for instance, where a school may not have a peanut. Mm. which sometimes they even, I mean, do better with other schools who may have. I mean, peanut is unavailable largely because of the lean season that we are in, in terms of that particular uh, food crop. So it can never be a case that a school will lack food and then students may have to resort to other means of eating. No, what can happen is that a particular food item may not probably be present at that particular moment uh, in terms of the food supply chain. So it's, it's like, just like your own house, you have about 18 food items, even coupled with the fact that we still give the schools money to buy perishable food items. Mm. And then one item is not missing. There is a tendency that you balance it with another one so that subsequently when you get it, then you, you proceed. So, I mean, if you hear, for instance, you ask leading questions for students to solicit a certain response and students say, we don't have, a, we don't have. Mr. A, Mr. Kwate, I believe that you're not trying to uh, discredit the work we've done as a media house because uh, we have fact and figures backing this particular story. And you have gone, you, you, you have gone to the ground. I mean, I, I have to tell you that we actually reported what the parents told us, what some of these children also told us. And so this, this cannot be uh, different from what is on the ground. I mean, you are painting a totally different picture from what the parents have been telling us. And I, I just want to tell you that uh, this is just a, a portion of the video you've seen. Uh, the full video will be out there. And so I believe that you're not trying to discredit what you've seen so far as, as the reality on the ground. A very dispassionate conversation about resolving every challenge that we have. Fair enough. But you see, on one side, Joy FM goes to do the job, get different images. Mm. On the other side, the ministry together with Joy FM and no other media stations involved. This is okay, the Mr. Kwate, res respectfully, re respectfully uh, I think that more uh, revelations will come out from this particular documentary when it's finally aired. We are so, so grateful for your time speaking to us here on Join Us Prime. Now, I've also been joined by Clement Apak. He is on the Education Committee in Parliament. And uh, uh, we want to find out from you, uh, Mr. Park, government is maintaining that there is enough food on the campuses. How do you react to this uh, position? Well, it is obvious that government, as has always been the case, since the inception of the Christian school policy, mm. 
Mm. It depends. Even when there is concrete evidence to suggest that the findings of multimedia are in consonance with what parents know, what the students experience, what the teachers and the heads know, and what independent bodies like PIAC have reported going back to 2018, 2019. Mm. So the issue of inadequate food, sometimes for wholesome food, and the supply of one staple in excessive quantity to one school are the reality on the ground. And look, let me clear. This narrative about the minister deploying staff and going out to schools and taking the media, we all know that these are planned visits. And therefore, the tendency to try and send a bad information and somehow twist the arm of the school to present what is not the status quo cannot be taken over the actual work that multimedia has done, unannounced, organic, as also confirmed by parents, by students, and teachers. Let's call a spade a spade. The policy is a good policy. It has implementation challenges. Every stakeholder and government has agreed that the time has come for the policy to be reviewed. And I want to state this on authority. Mm. The Akufado Bahamia NDC government is being very hypocritical. This is the same government which I saw the IMS in the January published review of the bailout that we entered into with the IMS on page 6, line 47. Mm. When I saw the IMS that in the educational sector, we will review and rationalize the free high school program. So why is government is standing and it's always very big to attack those of us who have been calling attention to these challenges and calling on government to do what Ghanaians are asking it to do, review the policy so that we can address these challenges, including the issue of food. Okay. Hello, Mr. Paul. So we have to be calling out the government. They can't tell the IMF that they will review and rationalize the policy. And yet the president in parliament told us that we should stop the debate and look at improving it. The flood battle of the NPP did similar when he presented his policy, improve upon it. The Minister for Education also chooses to use the word improve upon it. There's the same government led by Dr. Alad Mahmoud of India in their discussions with the IMF have told the IMF that they will review and rationalize it. All right. And government is fruitful and admit the challenges so that we can collectively fight to address them. So from where you sit, uh, you believe that the government is not committed to a review. So tell us, how should this uh, challenge be solved as a nation, this food crisis in our schools? Well, we have said that if we are given the mandate to govern this country, our flood better has more with our number. And if I believe it is the reason why this government and top officials of the government, the president and the vice and the minister for education, are running away from using it, the word refuse, because John Damadipa was the first to use it. So they are prepared to tell the IMF that they will review and rationalize, but they are not prepared to admit to Ghanaian mm. that they will do the same, because they are afraid that John Mahama would be and dear in the eyes of the Ghanaian public for saying something that should have been five years ago. Some of the things that we have considered, and if you ask Nagrat, you ask Nat, you ask Chad, you ask African Education, 
the area of Eden. We are proposing a return to the pre prisoner's school model. Mm. Where the money or the feeding grant should go to the schools and let the schools identify their own suppliers and procure the food from their own identified suppliers. That is one. We also are asking for the reinstatement of the parent teacher association to where they used to be to play the frontal role compared to the current arrangement where they have now been reduced to a voluntary association. We are also looking at bringing on board the private school and allowing them to participate in the delivery of the free senior school policy. Because the kids that go to private schools are equally gone. These are just a few of the ideas that we believe if given the opportunity, we will table within the context of a national stakeholder forum, bringing all stakeholders, the media, the parents, the, 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 the chief dancing institutions, religious bodies, to have an honest conversation, an assessment of the policy implementation challenges, and let us agree as a nation mm. where we want it to go. All right. That is our alternative. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Park, for speaking to us here on Joy News Prime. We'll still keep our eyes on the story as it unfolds. Now, away from that story, an eight-year-old class, three people, Ikea, uh, uh, Ikuma's dream of becoming a midwife, uh, just like a mother, is gradually fading away as doctors say she needs an urgent bone marrow transplant treatment after she was diagnosed with cancer of the blood cells, leukemia. Ikea's mother says the family does not have the resources to raise the $88,000 required for the treatment. It's appealing to benevolent people for support. My colleague Maxwell Agbagba has more. Eight-year-old Ikea lies on a bed at the pediatric oncology unit of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. The once active tennis player for her school is unable to move any part of her body. She's weak and the clock continues to tick on her deteriorating health condition. Seated by her side holding her hand is her mother, Sharon Nadu Ankuma. Ikuya's mother, a midwife, has been confined to the Kolibu Teaching Hospital as a result of her daughter's condition. She has been describing the processes leading to Ikuya being diagnosed with leukemia, cancer of the blood. So she's very active. She's not a sickler. She has never been diagnosed of any previous illness. She does a day in and day out activities normal. But later part in November last year, I realized she gets this temperature, which is on and off. It comes and goes, comes and goes. So in December, when she's going to school, sometimes she will, she will refuse actually. Then there are times she'll tell me she'll go. Then I also observe that she's having temperature. Then one day I just saw these lymph nodes. There was one here and one just behind the ears. I thought maybe it's one of those things that will go. And later I saw she's having this yellowish discoloration of the eyes. It was very yellow. So when I saw that, I saw that mm, when you see this yellow thing, it's either the liver or the kidney which mm -hmm. is at stake. So I just took her to the children's hospital where we saw the doctor. We did the tests, we ran the full blood counts. But the WBCs were so high, the white blood cells were so high, and she was also having distended abdomen. It was a little bit bigger than the normal. Then the scan proved that the liver is enlarged, the spleen is also enlarged. Then this yellowish discoloration may be as effect of the liver. So we ran a series of tests. We even had some to be sent to India for confirmation. We did something they call the flow cytometry, which came and they confessed it's an acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Sharon says the family is in urgent need of 88,000 US dollars, which is the total cost of medical treatment in India. And I don't know how we are going to raise such an amount. And she is also not going to be fit if the bone marrow transplant is not done. Yes, she is going weaker and weaker by the day. Here at this ward, I've met Ikuya's 19-year-old brother, Edward Ivan Denny Ankuma. 
He says he's surprised his once active sister is unable to move any part of her body now. He's also appealing for support. Yeah, she's brilliant. She's brilliant and active. You know. She's interested in sports, sporting activities. Let me support her. Let's try their best. Like, so she gets to We also do our part. Senior resident at the pediatric oncology unit of the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, Michael Akboke, says Ikuya needs an urgent bone marrow transplant. So, um, we have started to treat her as we usually do after confirming the diagnosis. And for some months now, it seems the results we're getting is that this type of leukemia is not responding to the regular treatments that we usually offer. So that would mean a more aggressive approach, okay? So that's why we are proposing that as soon as possible, the Kia needs to get bone marrow transplantation to have a chance at cure. So as soon as possible. So what we're doing is to do our bit to keep the cancer cells from continuously multiplying. But the earliest we can get her transplanted, the better. <laughs> Most cancers in children, unfortunately, we can't pinpoint, unlike in adults, where we know if you smoke or you take a lot of alcohol or exposure to lots of things. Yes, those are the things we know. But for children, peculiarly, we don't seem to be able to pinpoint environmental contributors to the cancers. We know, for instance, if the child has been exposed to radiation, so things like X-ray, you know, the tests that we do, or CT scans, if they've been exposed a lot, then there is a, there is a risk of her getting leukemias. Or if the mother was exposed during pregnancy, there's also a risk of the child getting leukemias. Sometimes there are some genetic factors that the children are born with that makes them, that predisposes them to getting um, this cancer of the blood. You're still watching Join News Prime with me, Carlos Caloni. I believe you may want to contribute to help this young girl, uh, you know, realize her dream of becoming a midwife. We have more after this break. Welcome back and thank you so much for staying with us. Let's take you to Parliament where the showing of the Joy News' documentary Sick Hospitals nearly disrupted sitting today. The documentary which details the hopelessness in a number of public health facilities in Ghana when it comes to basic equipment was shown on the large screens of the House as part of ranking member of the Health Committee, uh, Governor Minta Akando's debate of the President's message on the state of the nation. But some MPP MPs led by first Deputy Speaker uh, Joseph Osei Uso will not allow that. Uh, Parliamentary Affairs Correspondent Kweku Asante report. That documentary by Joy News showed the poor state of Ghana's hospitals. Today, it was shown in Parliament by MP Fajuaboso, an NDC minority spokesperson on health, to show that the President's State of the Nation address did not address the health needs of the public. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what we have in Ghana now is what we call sick hospitals. Hospitals that are sick. Yes, sick hospitals. Yes, Mr. Speaker, with your permission. And I have already cleared with leadership. I have a video. It is an ultimate walk of shame for any visitor to the Sandema Hospital in the Bulsan North District of the Upper East Region. But midway through the presentation, the first Deputy Speaker, Joseph Oseusi, was on his feet, imploring the Speaker to stop the showing of that documentary in Parliament and asking under which rules the MP for Joaboso was showing that documentary. Mr. Speaker, I want to know under which of our rules this video is being shown in the chamber. Who authorized it? And who gave the change for the battle to play Wait. that? Our rules must guide what we do in the chamber. Some more NPP MPs, including Samuel Atatia, and then another former, and then a former Minister for Environment, Science and Technology, also registered their displeasure. This house, 
What is the meaning of this? How can we validate uh, uh, what he's trying to show us? What, what is the source of this? If, with respect, if this is an ancient matter that he's trying to force on our imagination, how do we know it? So please, honorable speaker, it cannot be authenticated, and therefore you shouldn't feed us with propaganda. But you have to know that if you are doing, I saw some pictures of crimes, and I submit that it's unethical to present clients in those settings, hospital settings, without their permission. So, Mr. Speaker, even if leadership agreed, I would have objected that they erred in that agreement. It's unethical to show patients in that kind of situation. We do not have their permission to show that permission. Well, eventually, this documentary was curtailed. It was not shown in full on the floor of the house. But the minority made that point clear that this is a new precedent that they will be seeking to hold even the president and ministers responsible for on the floor of the house if they ever come and try to show documentaries or any other audiovisuals as part of making their case on the floor. I discussed that issue with you. You directed that I discussed with leadership. Mr. Speaker, I discussed this issue with the, minor the minority chief whip and the majority chief whip. I even gave him a copy. I sent a copy to him. Mr. Speaker, I don't do things by heart. I so, so leadership agreed. Mr. Speaker, ask the member of But we didn't discuss at the plenary. Well, the State of the Nation address debate continued today. We heard from the minority spokesperson on finance, Isaac Adongo, who made a case in terms of why he believes that Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia should not be allowed anywhere near the presidency. Mr. Speaker, I would like to indicate that as the NDC is getting ready to fix Dr. Baumia's mess, he should understand that it is time for him to learn to understand the policies of the NDC. We are not only bringing 24-hour economy, we have a series of policy interventions that are carefully thought out and crafted to show him better digitalization and improve the economy of our country. The State of the Nation debate is expected to conclude next week. And MPs on both sides of the aisle are seizing to make the case for why their governments or their parties should either retain power or be elected to lead the government. And the NDC minority are making Dr. Baumia a certain plinch pain in terms of making their case and stressing that Dr. Mahmoud Baumia cannot be extricated from the current economic challenges we face in the country. But the, but the NPP MPs will have none of that. Reporting for Joy News, Kiku Asante, Parliament House, Accra. Now, a water technology national certificate one and two program has been launched at the St. Paul School in Kukurantumi in the eastern region to train ambitious young students to become certified technicians to keep the country's water systems running. The Commission for Technical Vocational Education and Training Curriculums aims at improving skills and bridging the technical knowledge gaps in water service delivery in Ghana. Maxwell Kudeto was at the launch of the new curricula and has come through with the following report. The curriculum is designed to equip students with the skills necessary to repair and maintain crucial infrastructure such as water treatment systems, water technology and water pumps in rural areas as well as managing public and private water systems to provide more reliable access to clean water for communities across the country. The curriculum is implemented in partnership with CTVET, TVET, UNICEF, and Global Water Center, among others, with funding from Grand Force Foundation, a key account manager of Grand Force Foundation. Mr. Clements Nate Tete expressed that the organization is happy with the feats achieved so far and hope that some 1 million Ghanaians will have access to clean water by 2025 in line with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This journey began with a vision to bridge technical knowledge gaps in water service delivery. Through dedicated collaboration, we've achieved a remarkable feat. The development and acceptance of a pioneering CTVET curriculum by the Ghana government.
crafted in partnership with the global water sector. This curriculum represents a beacon of hope to communities across Ghana. Today, as we approach the official launch, we are reminded of the power of collaboration and shared purpose. We extend our deepest gratitude to all partners whose unwavering support has made this vision a reality. To our students, I will encourage you to take full advantage of the program to develop yourselves, since this will position you to take advantage of the numerous opportunities this skill and knowledge will offer you in the water sector, not only in Ghana, but across Africa. On his part, the Danish ambassador to Ghana, His Excellency Mr. Tom Norin, commended government's interest in technical and vocational training in the country. And vocational education in transforming Ghana's economy into a productive economy capable of employing the growing young population. As the CEO for Global Water Center, Thomas Johnston, said in the beginning, water is crucial. It is, both for life and for most industries, or as TJ said, for everything. To solve water crisis, and there are water crises around the world, and to meet the demands, the future needs water solutions, but also many more water professionals. That's the path you're on your way to. Director General of CTVET, Dr. Frechi Asamwa, says the program is timely. In a long number of years, we as a country did not focus on skill development that much. But what the government has done, the investment that government has put in TVET and is continuing to do, um, um, in the next 10, 15 years, that's when we are going to feel the impact. For instance, today we have developed um, water technology curriculum at certificate one and two level. That means that if somebody completes certificate one, they don't want to continue again. They can go to the job market and work. After certificate two, they can go to the job market and work. Many a times we talk about graduate unemployment, but pre-tertiary unemployment is even critical. And that is the new focus government is looking at. How do we make sure that the 60 to 70 percent of uh, our young Ghanaians who do not right away go to tertiary, what kind of jobs are they going to do? And the job they're going to do is to quickly make sure they are well skilled for a job that is in existence. Maswa Kudeko reports for Joy News.